The first reading today is from the Old Testament and it's Samuel, it's chapter 7 and it's verses 2 through to 15. The ark remained at kiriath Jirim a long time, 20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as a leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hands of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offerings, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel, and Israel delivered the neighbouring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. And the second reading um, from the New Testament is John, and it's chapter 21, and it's verses 15 to 25. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. 
Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus does not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, this, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies these, to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. It's interesting that uh, Sasha was talking about listening. You heard about the gentleman who was at the doctor's and he said to the doctor, I think my wife is going deaf. He said, well, there's a simple test. He said, uh, one day when she's occupied and you stand behind her for a distance, and you ask her a question. And if she, if she doesn't respond, you move closer. So the next day he, she's preparing dinner with her back to him and he, he's distance off and he says, Darling, what are we having for dinner? And there's no response. So he comes a bit closer. He said, Darling, what are we having for dinner? No response. He came a bit closer. Darling, what are we having for dinner? Still no response. So he came closer. He said, Darling, what are we having for dinner? No response. So she stands right behind her. He said, Darling, what are we having for dinner? He says, I told you four times, it's fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing not being able to hear. It's another thing not listening. Let me uh, pray that God indeed will speak to us from his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word, to listen to you. Lord, I pray that you might speak to us, that we might understand and we might have the will to obey. And I pray in Jesus' name. The passage we're looking at is actually bringing us to the end of a, a time in Israel's history which is called the time of the judges, which could be referred to as the Dark Ages. If you've read the book of Judges, you wouldn't come away terribly in, encouraged. Some of the terrible things that happened there. But this actually marks the end of the time of the Judges. And, but it ends in a very positive note. We see that the people of Israel are turning back to God. Now, what has been the problem to this point? In the book of Samuel, we actually see three issues that have caused a problem for Israel. The first one is the failure of spiritual leadership. The second is the domestication of God. And the third one is covenantal infidelity. If we look back in uh, chapter 2, we see there the sons of Eli. They weren't very good at their job. Well, they thought they were good at job because they got a good something out of it. They were in it for their own interest. They had taken over the job of the priesthood from Eli. They were supposed to be leading the people in the ways of God. And all they, all they did was try to get something out of it. They looked after themselves, number one, not the people of God. And God deals with this. He deals with it by the birth of a child. A child delivered to Hannah and Elkanah, Samuel. And we see there how Samuel 
He's a man, as he grows up as a child, he's brought to, the, to Shiloh, to the temple. He, he, he grows up there. He's a, a person that God speaks to and calls. You remember when, when uh, God says, Samuel, and he thinks it's Eli talking, and he goes running to him, wakes him up and says, what do you want? Three times he spoke to him, and Eli finally woke up and said, well, here am I, Lord, your servant hears. And God calls him to himself. And eventually, as he grows up and becomes a mature man and a, a servant of God, his heart certainly is after God. So that's how God dealt with the issue of a failed spiritual leadership. The second one is the domestication of God. Remember the story where we, earlier on when they went to battle against the Philistines, which was a major, major force in the area at the time. And they're losing. So what do they do? They drag out the Ark of the Covenant and they take it out into the battle lines because they thought if they drag the Ark out, they've got to, God's got to come with them. So what have they done? They've confined, you know, confined God to a box. They think if they've got the ark, they've got God. And this is domesticating God because it's a bit like I, I could refer to as the, the genie in the lamp syndrome. You know Aladdin? Gets old lamp, rubs it, genie pops out and he gives you anything you want. Well, that's how they were thinking about God. You've got God in the box. You take him to the front line. He's got to fight for you. So how does God deal with that one? Well, the ark is captured, isn't it? Is God captured? If you read the story, you know, he's in, in, the, in the temple of Dagon. What happens to Dagon? <laughs> Head off, arms off, hands off. God is not confined, but God took the, the Ark of the Covenant out of the centre of the worship of the people of God. It is returned because the, the Philistines can't put up with all the stuff that goes on around it. You know, all the bo uh, boils or whatever they get, all the sores and everything else that happens. And you know, it's not returned to the centre of the worship of the people of God until the time of David. When he sets up a tabernacle in Jerusalem, sets up the tabernacle and returns the ark. So it's, it's removed from the centre of the worship of, of, of God's people because they tried to domesticate him. They tried to control him. The third one actually is addressed in the passage that was read today. Covenantal infidelity. What do I mean from that? Well, you've got to go back to the covenantal documents which are found in Exodus chapter 20. They were written on stone. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and brought you out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other God but me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image of the likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. For I, am the, for I the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And I visit the sins of the fathers and to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I show mercy to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. In chapter 7 we are told that the people began to turn back to God. And what is the first thing that Samuel tells them to do? To get rid of their idolatry to get rid of their idolatry, to return to the covenantal relationship that God has established with his people. I will be your God and you shall be my people. He tells them to stop worshipping Baal and the female concert Ashtoreth and to turn back to the Lord. Get rid of it. It's the first thing you need to do. You need to get rid of the things out of your life which is distracting you from a pure worship of the living God. That's what he says to them. And they do. 
they do. If you if 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 you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then rid yourself of the foreign gods. Change the direction of your life. In the Bible, that's often referred to as repentance. The change the direction of life is repentance. The first thing needed to establish a relationship with God is to change the direction of life. What's Samuel doing in chapter 7? He's leading the people in a process of restoring the relationship with a God that they have neglected. He exercised a strong spiritual ministry to do this. The second thing we notice in, in this chapter is that Samuel makes intercession for them. In verse 5, And Samuel said, Assemble your Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with you with the Lord. And I will intercede with you with the Lord. He, now he is taking on a priestly role. The priests in the Old Testament, of course, were those who stand between God and his people, those who represented both ways and those who represented the people to God and asked for forgiveness. They were involved in the whole process of, of the, the worship side of, of God, but mainly to represent God to his people and, uh, and people to his, their God. And Samuel says, if you come to Mizpah, Let's get together. Let's have a rally. Let's have a Billy Graham crusade. That's really what he's saying. Let's get together and do this together. And I'll intercede with you. I will talk to God. And I will seek to have him establish, re-establish the relationship you've had in the past that he's had with his people. It's interesting about God. There's a child crossing the bridge of life and becomes fearful and looks up and says to God, can I hold your hand? And God says, no, I will hold yours. And the child says, what is the difference? The difference is if you hold on to mine, you will let go. If I hold on to yours, I will never let go. God never lets go of his people. They might want to stray from him, but he never lets go of his people. And the faithfulness of God, if we're talking about the judges period, if you want to see the faithfulness of God through a period which was very difficult and which the people really weren't honouring him, that's it. It's interesting, I, I was, I was uh, acting director of Leichhardt some years ago and we were doing this, uh, the assistant who was there when I arrived said, we've decided to do judges. I said, okay, that's the decision made, let's work through it. I got part of the way through, he said, can we change it? So I thought, finding it too difficult. I said, no, we decided this is the word of God, we've got to work through it. So with the last one, I got my son-in-law to preach it because uh, it's the one about the about the concubine, and uh, it's a very it's a horrible story. So I decided I wouldn't do it. I got my son-in-law to do it, <laughs> who's a more college graduate. But God does not give up on His people. And it's encouraging to see how God has brought this man Samuel to them. And he now is walking them through a process of acknowledging that God is sovereign in their lives and that they need to come back to him. Repentance, intercession. The next one is confession. It's very interesting. Some years ago in the Sydney Dyson and Anglican churches we went a bit... Um, What's the word? Hillsongy? 
which is not bad. But some of the some of the hill song songs are okay. Um, but you know, we got a bit more, you know, jazzy about the whole thing. Oh, and I didn't mind actually. But do you know what I found that most churches left out? The confession. Because some people were saying that's too negative. It's too negative. You're thinking about sin. Well, if you're not a sinner, don't think about it. If you've never done anything wrong, if you've never thought anything wrong, if you've never neglected what is right, if you've never spoken something which, which you wish you'd taken back, then you don't need to think, think about sin. And it's nice to have Jesus amongst us. Because he is the only one who's ever done that. And when they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. Verse 6. On that day they fasted and there they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. It's one thing to expect a relationship with God. It's another thing to get that relationship right. We need to acknowledge, always need to acknowledge where we've failed before God. Confession is important. Because it does acknowledge before God the sins of our own hearts, the sins of our lives. But it does more than that. It asks God to deal with them. Because we on our own cannot deal with the sins of our own lives. We cannot. Was it Psalm 32 you read? I don't know. We read a psalm. Psalm of David. The blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are converted, covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him and who, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning all day long, through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sins, says David, to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Things have not changed. It wasn't just Israel or David or someone back there who's a sinner. What does Paul tell us? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Think about that for a minute. What is the glory of God? It is his perfection. Absolute perfection. It's very interesting. Uh, sometimes I used to run classes of baptism and stuff like that, and I used to ask the question, are you, is there, are you perfect? And you know who used to put their hands up sometimes as a joke? The men. <laughs> I'd see an occasional men go, yep, that's me. I said, yeah, well, let me talk to your wife for a while and we'll see. No. Samuel indicates to them and leads them in a process of confession, acknowledging your sin. It's no point in asking for forgiveness until you acknowledge before God what you need to be forgiven for. The, th the next thing that happens is sacrifice. We see that in verse 9. 
And Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Now, sacrifice had been known for, for generations, hundreds of years. In Hebrews 9, verse, verse 22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that's what the sacrifice was during the Old Testament. It was time and time again they sacrificed was to show that the, that the, the blood was being shed. What is the wages of sin? Death. Not just physical death. Spiritual death and eternal death. And how is that dealt with in the Bible? In the Old Testament, there's the illustration or the prefiguring of a greater death in the death of a lamb. In John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus walking down the street. And what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He might as well say, behold the sacrifice of God that takes away the sin of the world, because that's what he was referring to. The lamb. Samuel gets a lamb and he sacrifices. It sheds the blood. Looking forward to a greater time when the, the, the blood of the Son of God is shed on the cross. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Our sins need to be atoned for. It's not that God just says, oh, okay. You know, sometimes I say to my kids when they apologise, well, that's okay. But when it comes to our sin, because the wages of sin is death, you can't just ignore that. Talking to, to back at, uh, at Adam and Eve, the day you sin, you shall surely die. But Jesus, his blood covers a multitude of sins. It is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He dies in our place. In sort of an illustrative form, this, this lamb that Samuel sacrificed is dying in the place of the people, but looking forward to another death, a death that will be permanent in terms of its effect. It won't be permanent in terms of the person because he will come back to life again, showing that he has conquered death. But its effect will be permanent. I sometimes interview staff for William Carey Christian School because I'm on the board there. And uh, one of the questions I sometimes ask, I say, well, you go to church every week. I said, have you ever seen the minister slaughter an animal up the front? I said, no, I haven't seen that. I said, why not? The Bible talks about slaughtering animals. And they have to think for a while. And most of forget of it after a while because it's no longer necessary because of the death of Jesus. It is permanent and sufficient. So there is a sacrifice offered. So what do we see? Repentance, intercession, confession and sacrifice to bring the people of God back to him. In this rally that, that Samuel calls, it's a rally so people can again direct their hearts back to the living God who they turned away from and worshipped other gods. Well, there's some very interesting things that happen next. First, we see that God rescues his people. We see that the Philistines, who had actually misinterpreted what the Israelites were doing, they thought they were gathering, preparing for war. 
They didn't understand it at all. It says, while Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such panic that they were routed before the Israelites. God would not have a bar of them interfering with this with the establishment of relationship with his people. He stood between them and this gathering and he protected them because they were routed by the Israelites eventually. And it's interesting because they didn't come back in the time of Samuel. And then Samuel sets up a symbol, our rocks, a bit small, Sashi. We need something as tall as this building or something. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Referring to the help of the Lord, Ebenezer. That's what it means. The Lord is my help. What was it put there for? It was put there as a reminder to the people of God that God is their help. He is the one who has stepped in respect to the Philistines, but he has stepped in respect to the establishment of their own relationship, re-establishment of their own relationship with him, which goes back to the birth of Samuel. It goes back to the, the removal of the ark in the centre of the, of, the, uh, of the worship. And it goes back to the, the, the restored fidelity of the covenant in, in casting aside idols. Now, it's still there. It's still there. Now, you know, churches often have crosses. And we don't worship crosses. And we don't worship one, certainly, with a, a figure of a man on them. What is the cross meant to remind us of? It's meant to remind us of the intervention of Jesus, of God in the person of Jesus for our salvation. That's what it's meant to do. And it's not a bad thing, as long as you don't make that the idol. But it becomes a reminder. A reminder that of Ebenezer, that God is our help. It's he who has stepped into this world to be our saviour, our helper, our redeemer. The last thing that happens, very interesting too, Verses 13, 14. And there was peace between Israel and the Ammonites. Because the Philistines had been subdued, there was peace in the land. But why was God establishing peace? It's so that the ministry, his ministry, can go on. A faithful, godly ministry. And the life of Samuel is like that. And Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year he went on circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And there he also held court and he built an altar there to the Lord. A settled people of God receive a settled ministry of the word of God. A couple of things to finish. You notice the second reading? Who's it about? Who was it about? That's not a rhetorical question. Who was it about? 
Peter. It was about Peter. Now, if anyone needed to be rejected, he did. What did he do when Jesus was, was arrested? He denied him three times. But does God give up on him? He actually gets three opportunities to say, I love you. And he gives him a ministry of the word. John writing to, to a church. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe th may this be your experience this day and always. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we see in the day of Samuel, but we thank you even more for what we see in the day of Jesus. And we are the beneficiaries of his death and resurrection and the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you in his name. Amen.